Kirk, who is the chief leader of the opposition against care data, but she can't be with us because they preparing amendments for the debate in House of Lords, which is going to happen on the 7th of May. So it's something worth keeping an eye for, uh, because I think it will rephrase quite considerably what that care data will end up as. Uh, so just to sort of frame the, the issue of, uh, of the value of data for individuals and why do we care, uh, I came across the, the first issue of personal data and sensitivity to it uh, in cyber cafes. Because when we opened, obviously, we realized that a lot of people had no idea how personal data uh, needs to be looked after. So the first thing they did is to use cyber uh, cafes and machines in the cyber cafes to create uh, their own memos, their own emails, quite often very intimate, quite often highly secure, and just left it there for everybody to see after they finished. So we spent five years trying to scrape it out and clean the hard drives and teach people uh, to very little effect. I think people generally have very little understanding how important the data is. I remember my first memo that I found on the Siberia hard drive was uh, somebody wrote a memo about a cocaine addict in a big company next door to us and left it on the, in the open space. So I think the problem with that, that we still, 20 years later, we still have the same issue. But data does have value, obviously. And if you look at the first uh, presence of data in the retail environment, it started about um, eight, 1879 in America. Uh, it was cash deal and cash register was invented in order to protect the shop owner from the employees who were stealing the money. So right from the beginning, data was set up asymmetrically. So the one who gathered uh, was monitoring the one who was inputting the data. If you see the little uh, bit on the side is the first receipt. That's a cash machine with the first receipt. So that's how the starters started like a basic surveillance machine. Uh, so I'm to close the turn on the lights, maybe. Yeah. So then I'm forwarding another few years, I ended up in a top shop running the e-commerce operation and setting up all the Siberia e-commerce. No. Okay, that's... No, we can't do that? You can't do all the... No, okay, well, put it doesn't matter. And I learned uh, very quickly what was going on there because uh, we restarted the first uh, store card. And it was a very straightforward deal. We asked the customers to put, stem, to, to put their data into the form, uh, and we gave them in exchange for that 10% discount. Uh, we made 20%, and we decided that 10% was a fair value to split. And that sort of stuck. Since then, if you look at all the store cards uh, schemes, they always give 10% off. But what has changed since then is obviously the data storage and, the, and computation has gone down. So this is one thing that we wanted to address. And, uh, we were extremely careful with the data because large brands, large retail, uh, is all about keeping the customer trust. But what we've noticed halfway through around 2005, uh, people like Yahoo showed up and Amazon and eBay who were not at all interested in trust in data. They were just interested in data. And they, uh, following of European Union law and data protection law was about zero. But they learned very quickly from a company called Palantir how to handle a lot of data in quite cheap way. Uh, and with that tool in hand, um, we started using it in commerce in a, in a way that I just wanted to quickly show you how it's done. So for example, Richard, who is my co-founder, just had a little baby, so he normally shops for uh, Pampers, so Tesco knows that, but they're not going to make much money on it. So they, they will be looking for the inputs around Facebook, Twitter, what else does he do with himself? And so they would find he's a very social animal, so they would find that he might be interested in beer. So lo and behold, they would put beer at the end of the stack with the nappies in Tesco, because when he's buying his nappies, he might be interested in the beer as well. And knowing Richard, he definitely is interested in the beer. <laughs> so now they made a little bit more money just by finding out additional things about him that they wouldn't necessarily find from their own database. 
Uh, but the real big prize of big data is the share of the share of wallet. Uh, to get the information what else Richard spends his money on, typically you had to go out quite far and ask exit interviews, talk to people, get a lot of uh, unstructured data, code it by hand. It was very expensive, so very few people did that. Now it's cheap. You just look at social uh, on Facebook, on Twitter, and you have total share of the wallet of everybody. It takes very little. So in the olden days, we had to bring, people had to bring slaves into Western Af from Western Africa to work on foundation on the sugar canes. And today we are slaves ourselves. We put all the data for free. The cost of gathering of share of wallet to big companies is absolutely nothing. So of course, they create so much data, it's so much of that, that they needed to create a post of data scientists. So my little top shop has now post of data scientists, which really is not scientists at all. There's nothing scientific about it. It's just being a fisherman. Because you don't have to standardize anything. You don't have to replicate everything. It's just fishing around for a lot of data. So if we're looking for making more money out of research, we could use Palantir software and uh, look at the mentions, what his friends are talking about. Well, Richard's friends would be talking about games. So if you find that he talks about games, and there is a new console coming up, Maybe that's what we're going to sell him. And if you see the progress, 15 pounds, 12 pounds, 399 pounds. This is a big, big golden prize for finding out share of wallet of Richard. Because if you put in the nappies, beer, Xbox, he will definitely buy all of them. <laughs> but he will overpay quite severely because 399 is probably the top price Tesco is selling it now. In fact, you can get the same product for about 300. So even if they give him 10% off, they're still making massively like bandits. Uh, and Richard is out of pocket by a So the gold nuggets coming from knowing more, and it does work. Unfortunately, it does work. Uh, obviously, a lot of this research is a bit crazy because it's all correlation. So this is a nice example which I found recently. The more you feed your scientists chocolate, the more Nobel Prize they will win. Right? Or the less you use Internet Explorer, the less murders will occur in your neighborhood. <laughs> and if you troll Internet for stuff like that, it's pretty amazing. But the serious stuff about it is that it's all fed from the defense budget. So we did a little bit of research, and sure, big data is basically about 1% of US defense budget. That's about 7 billion. Uh, on, on top of it, uh, another 7 billion comes from CRM, from uh, uh, the fraud protection, and altogether we have a market at the moment of around $14 billion. It's pretty massive, so it cannot be disregarded. And when you look at who is providing the tools, who is actually in the technology, uh, it's really very interesting because in my long career in technology, I found that the more cuddly the logo, the more sinister the company. <laughs> <laughs> and if you look at the Hadoop yellow elephant and the little bee with hive, Trust me, 99% of these guys are working for surveillance, for Big Brother, and for all sorts of things in Saudi Arabia you don't even want to know about. So <laughs> if you see everybody, anybody with a logo from the zoo, uh, think. Uh, and it gets worse because it's all kind of military driven, it's an arms race, obviously. My big data is bigger than yours. So the Hadoop is now being able to hold probably the whole data from the whole universe. But the question is what it is, what they do next. They need more data. And that's where our conversation comes into it, because uh, Palantir has managed to befriend our government. It's a big, a big supplier for surveillance data. Uh, and now they would like to have a look at our NHS data, because NHS has got a fantastic set of data, and it's a live data, which is fresh. Because as you know, data is like dogs. It ages. Every month, it loses value. NHS produces data daily. So what Palantir is trying to do, they obviously having a lot of projects which are machine learning projects, and they need to feed these machine learning projects with data. So if you read our favorite Roy Kurzweil and Singularity and all the data machine stuff, it's all great, but you need massive amount of data to feed it. So half of the issue with the NHS data sales is not just monetizing, but also it's sort of a side effect of the need to find more data to feed all these projects. So it's sort of standing upside down at the moment. Uh, and obviously our government is where it is. We've got around 107 billion deficit. Uh, this is not going to get any smaller. In fact, they're saying it's going to get smaller. We don't think so. 
and NHS is about 80 billion of it. So any monet monetizing, any way of recouping any money, obviously they're going to jump at. Uh, but as we started from the beginning, the trust that we had in Topshop and in Siberia to look after people, that trust is gone because not even my children know that you mustn't put your name into Facebook. You mustn't mention anybody specific on Twitter. If you write your favorite brand, you always use zero for all and I for L. And you know, my kids are 13 and they're already beginner, beginners cryptographers. Because I told them, don't write any names of it. Don't write any brands on it. So NHS, is it the new Facebook? I think that's what we have to discuss today. Wow. <laughs>